Well, I think it, it seems a bit fantastical for people that you, that you can actually change your physiology with light because it's not something that's kind of in any teaching. It's, you know, I've done, I've done three science degrees now and it was never mentioned once throughout the whole of that time. Um, and also because we do, you know, we do live in the world of, um, of pharmaceutical interventions. You know, actually red light generally was used therapeutically all over the world, you know, by people, you know, people were sent to sanatoriums where they were exposed to light. You know, the Nobel Prize was given to Niles Finson for treating smallpox with light. I, I think what happened was we had the wars and then we needed something, you know, immediate for uh, treating people and we discovered antibiotics and that was it. You know, we were off on that drug train and we haven't really got off that. And now it's it's a huge industry and, and that, you know, industry makes it very difficult for any of these other interventions to come in because there's a lot of, certainly there's a huge financial challenges of getting clinical trials. Um, and like I say, I think also it's just not what we're taught and it's certainly not what people are being taught in medical school. Hi, I'm Naomi Murphy and this is the Locked Up Living podcast where we talk with a wide range of people about harsh aspects of institutional life. We also explore some of the ways to overcome them and to grow and develop. I'm David Jones. So join us every Wednesday morning, six o'clock UK time for a fresh podcast. Today I'm delighted to be joined by Sarah Turner, who's the CEO of Sarah Thrive. Really, really great to have you on today, Sarah. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Hi, Sarah. Very nice to meet you and thanks for coming along. Can you tell us something about your career path? Because I gather it's quite a sort of interesting convoluted path. <laughs> of course. Yeah. So I started out uh, initially in fairly orthodox science. Uh, I went from doing a biology degree straight into the pharmaceutical industry um, as a research scientist uh, for a lot of the pharmaceutical companies, but uh, mainly for GlaxoSmithKline in their uh, inhaled product department. Um, so I did a fair bit of work there, culminating in some research looking at electrostatic charge in the body. Uh, and we were working actually to see whether we could um, enhance some of the products that Glaxo were producing that were causing different effects in different patients. And we actually managed to get round some of the issues by altering the plastics because we found out actually it was to do with the charge in the person's body that was causing these effects. But actually that started me off on a whole different journey because I began to understand the importance of actually it's the internal environment that's that's more important actually than the drug you're delivering. In so, well, not more important, but certainly is having a great effect. And, and so I then started down a journey of looking to see, okay, how can we improve the body from the inside out to start with? And so I went on then to do a nutrition degree. Um, I opened a health food shop down in uh, Dorset, where I am now. Uh, but then I also saw the limitations of that approach. And I actually started to study more about the brain and, and the placebo effect and all of those kinds of things. I did a neuroscience degree and moved to California. Uh, and that's when I got involved in the whole biohacker movement, you know, looking at how you can um, influence your biology to, to have an, a beneficial effect, a health optimization effect. And I actually got involved in some fairly unorthodox research over there. I was working as the head of science for a company that did conscious interface devices, consciousness interface. Mm. Yeah. What does it, what does that involve? I know it, it, it's a bit of a mouthful. It's very fringe actually. And it's based on a lot of work coming out of Princeton, uh, actually in the 1950s and, and how that's been developed, looking at how maybe it's possible to influence machines by your focused intention, uh, not necessarily machines, but anything in the external world. There's people who've done research on how you could maybe change the pH of water or have some kind of influence that's using some kind of force outside of our normal measurable forces. And it was a very interesting time. And I got to go to a lot of places and see a lot of different people. And actually, I, I became more interested in the placebo after that because there was some effect going on that, that we couldn't really describe. And I think we would really, in, in orthodox science, we'd call it the placebo effect because people are having some kind of effect that really... They shouldn't be having if you're looking at what's actually going on externally. You know, you could give someone some imprinted water and, and it would have an effect on the body. Now, 
what's going on there. You know, it was very difficult to ascertain. And I spent a long time trying to work out what that was. And eventually through doing all the biohacking, I kind of decided to move a little bit more into something where we could measure it, something like light. Um, because it's it's quite difficult actually to live in that world where you're living in this kind of, uh, I don't know, more woo-woo, esoteric world because you you need to measure things to really get a grasp on what's going on. And if you can't measure it, you know, it's very difficult to to keep going from a scientific point of view. So now really I spend most of my time in photobiomodulation, which is just a long word for light therapies. Sarah, that is a fantastic introduction. <laughs> and there's a lot there, uh, yeah. which we may get around to unpacking in the next three hours. Um, but can I take you back um, to almost the beginning? You were working for Glaxo Smith Klein um, on, 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 did you say inhaled product? So That's right. I take that to mean um, sort of asthma inhalers and things like mm -hmm. that. They're working with plastic items. And did I understand you say that it was the charge within the person that made a difference? Yeah, I mean, th this was some very interesting experiments because, uh, as we know, a lot of modern inhalers are made with plastic materials. And, and so you develop um, actually a static charge when you start to use those devices. And, and how those devices work is that they deposit a, a drug dose and they have a fine particle distribution that needs to go to the right place in the lung to have a therapeutic effect. However, if you have a, a, a charge in your body, that affects the deposition of the different um, sizes of particles, if you like, of drugs in the lung. And, and this was one of the findings from a lot of studies that we were doing is, okay, the state of your body, the amount of charge you're carrying in the, your body has a direct impact on the particle deposition inside your lungs. And, and, and this was very interesting to me because it carries across other things. I mean, we were looking at asthma drugs, but of course it's relevant for people who are living in London on the train line, you know, all of those fine particles that are in the air from car fumes and things. If your body has got um, a buildup of charge, your body isn't able to deal with those fine particles in the same way as if you didn't have that charge in your body. So something very simple like grounding, you know, standing on the ground uh, can have a, a, an interesting effect in this case because then you're dissipating that charge. You know, you're getting electrons up from the earth and you can actually change how your body responds in a very quick, real, tangible, measurable way to things like fine, par fine particles in the air or in a delivered device through an inhaler. Hey, thank you very much. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. So you're working for a pharmaceutical company and making all these uh, discoveries. Did you find that some of them conflicted with the kind of core financial interests of the company? Um, yes. Well, of course, I mean, pharmaceutical companies are a business and, and their business is making drugs to sell. I mean, that that is their business. So, you know, potentially, you know, you could have said to people, let's get all the asthmatic people around and talk about how we can dissipate charge more effectively and maybe they need more drug, uh, less drug. Uh, but no, that's not in Glaxo's interest to sell less drugs. So that obviously wasn't something that's on the table. You know, they were there to make drugs that could be used for asthma. You know, they weren't there to give people advice on how to take less drug. So from that point of view, yeah, there was a, there obviously is a conflict. Um, I'm not knocking Glaxo because, you know, that, that is their business and that's what they do. But that's certainly why the conflict that I found in myself that pushed me to, to leave that and look at something that was more holistic, like nutrition therapy. Well, thank you. And in your introduction, you also mentioned uh, placebo. And in a sense, we're all familiar with the idea of placebo. But uh, can you say a bit more about it from your point of view? I've thought about it a lot, actually, because of the work that I've done since leaving Glaxo, looking at people who've done all kinds of different therapies that, that do seem to have an effect. And the commonality that I find in a lot of these therapies is that one, that people really think that it's having an effect. People are getting the attention that they need because somebody is addressing them in some way using whatever modality it is, whether it be in printed water or even you know, I've seen people with cards, with all kinds of things. 
I think actually it's a human need to want to feel looked after, to feel safe, mm -hmm. and then your body can activate its own healing mechanism. And so I think for a lot of therapies, even, you know, traditional medical therapies, when you're going to the doctor, the doctor's saying, don't worry, I know what it is. Here's your tablet. I think probably there's a lot of placebo effects in, in almost all therapies that we do if done correctly. So I think it's a basic human connection interaction where people need to feel safe and then their bodies can maybe go into sy sympathetic or, you know, come out of that sympathetic arousal and go into parasympathetic and, and actually heal, allow their bodies to heal. So that is the culmination of kind of what I have been thinking about after like 10 years of research into more kind of alternative medicines is that I think very much it's to do with human connection and feeling safe. Thank you. I mean, you obviously think in, in, a, in a very wide, integrative uh, manner, uh, if that term means anything at all. Mm -hmm. um, but running through it seems to be a theme of uh, well-being. So yes. what do you think has led you to follow that particular path? Um, I just, I just have always been very curious in the body and how it works. And it's something that I, I don't know, from a very young age, I've always kind of read medical books or been interested in that, or even in more of a kind of almost a, a detective mind point, you know, I'm kind of English, of course, I grew up on Sherlock Holmes and all that kind of stuff. It's like trying to get, work things out, what's going on and be objective about working things out. Um, I haven't had a health journey. I know a lot of people who kind of get into this field have kind of had problems with their own health that hasn't been my trajectory actually I just come from a, a, a very curious place and I think because I have had these different experiences going from orthodox to very alternative to kind of now in a middle ground it, it gives me a, a wider perspective to kind of look at health generally uh, and just be interested I mean I really think that we, you know our bodies are probably the most technologically advanced thing we have on this planet right now I mean the human brain is is the greatest machine that, that we currently have access to. And so I, I'm always wondering why other people aren't so, why other people aren't spending their whole time studying it? Because, you know, it's, it's a never ending place of study and, and we have our own bodies that we can kind of experiment on. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. I um, happened to cross you on a podcast, I think it was called Know mm -hmm. Your Physio, when you were talking about lines and Light's really appealing to me. I read Linda Gettler's book on daylight mm -hmm. and how, how valuable that was. And what did how you first got interested in the therapeutic potential of light? Well, I got interested because I was in California and I was involved in the biohacker movement. And, and for people who don't know, it sounds a bit scary. But it's kind of come out of Silicon Valley. So they use that, that terminology like hacking, computer hacking. But really it just means putting your body in an environment where it works better, or if you're not able to put your body in that environment to hack that, to kind of find a shortcut for that and simulate that environment somehow. Um, and, and so things like, you know, your light environment, your food environment, your air environment, that's all part of biohacking. But actually I was making a movie where I was looking at water and how water becomes structured when, when you shine light onto water. Water actually changes its molecular structure in response to water. And this is research coming out of University of Washington, Professor Jerry Pollock. And I was lucky enough to, to actually go there and to see how he was doing his experiments and to hear his story and, and get involved in some of the projects that he was doing. And initially I was thinking, wow, this is great. We could maybe make structured water for people. Uh, but then I was kind of thinking, well, you know, I do have a neuroscience background. You know, the brain is water, you know, maybe we can shine light onto the brain and have some effect. And when I delved into it, actually there was a whole science already, people already doing that. Um, and so I was able actually to just ring up a researcher that was doing it and say, can I come and do some data collection on your trial? And he was kind enough to let me come, Dr. Marvin Berman. And I went to Philadelphia and I did some studies on uh, Parkinson's disease. And we were using 10.65 nanometer light with these big helmets and things. And I helped on the data collection uh, over three months. And I could see for myself, you know, that, that people were having a, a, an effect from that. So really that's what got me started on thinking, yeah, this is somewhere to focus my time because 
as we know, you know, there aren't really any drug treatments for neurodegeneration. And to put your time there and find something that actually works, you know, that's how I got into it. And really since going and doing that, that study in Philadelphia, that's where I focused all my time. Well, then I think um, red light's really fascinating in terms of it's got, a, it's really well established, isn't it? In yeah. terms of physical, as an aid to physical health and recovery. And I know I use a red light panel myself for things like um, injured, um, you know, sports injuries or period pains. And you can literally notice an improvement with one, one session of, of using, using red light. Why do you think it's so little discussed or promoted within medicine within the UK? Um, it's really interesting to hear that history because I'm just thinking about antibiotics and thinking about how adolescents might be given antibiotics for teenage acne, but actually blue light therapy is known to have quite a dramatic effect on, on yeah. people's skin, is it, in terms of destroy, helping destroy the, the bacteria. Yeah. Um, I wonder, you know, what are the potential benefits for mental health? You've mentioned you were working on a Parkinson's project, mm -hmm. but I wondered if you've got any more insights you could share for us around mental health. Yeah, I think certainly people are looking at um, light therapies for mental health specifically. And there are a lot of trials going on, um, mainly in the States or some in, some in Australia. Um, also here in the UK, Professor Paul Chazot up in Durham University is doing a lot of studies on all, all kinds of conditions, mainly neurodegeneration. Um, but I know uh, uh, Paolo Cassano, um, in the States, he's looking specifically at bipolar disorder or at long-term depression. People are looking at autistic spectrum disorder. There was a study published recently on depression and cognitive difficulties in people with Down syndrome. I, I think the reason why it's proving to be so successful with mental health problems is that it, it's really dealing with the root cause of why, you know, the brain is not functioning optimally rather than treating specific conditions. So what happens when you shine light onto the surface of the brain, or certainly what's in the current research is published, I'm not claiming that we know exactly how the body utilizes light, it is that the mitochondria, which is the small organ now inside the cell, which provides the cell with energy, that's where the light is received. And that's where that light is trans transformed into something useful. And certainly we see a, an increase in ATP, which is the energy getting to the cell. We see a release of nitric oxide, which means we get a dilation of blood vessels, which means we get a lot more blood flow, more oxygen, a removal of waste products. And then in the brain, we, we start to see things like um, promotion of neurogenesis, like growing new brain cells. So I think for something like mental health disorders, where people often suffer from, you know, just a lack of energy, you know. People are over toxic for whatever reason. You know, they've got a lot of stuff going on. People aren't sleeping well. You know, we know that if you give the brain a lot more energy, you can sleep better. All of those things, you know, compound to have an effect, you know, leads to more or less serious mental health conditions. So it, it's a very, it's a nice way to start to think about treating mental health because obviously it's, it's not toxic and you're only improving the health as you go along generally. You know, you're bringing the health of the body up generally, which helps people who have kind of mental health issues to be able to, one, deal with what they're doing, make better choices, and perhaps even it actually helps the structure of the brain as well. And just thinking about it, are there any side effects of like the too much light on the body? There's, there's not really any known side effects in all, you know, there's like 3,000 published studies on transcranial photobiomodulation with no documented side effects. I think one thing to mention is it is what they call a biphasic dose response, which means, you know, you can, if you don't shine enough light on the body, it doesn't have an effect. If you shine a certain amount, you get a positive effect. If you really do too much of it, then you negate the effect because then the body starts to work so fast that you build up more waste products than you can deal with. So although I would say no, that there's no known side effects. However, you can overdo it just like anything else. You know, you can drink too much water. You can, you know, it, it's, but I think for most people, you really would have to do a lot of light therapy to, to negate the effects. For most people, there are no known side effects documented in the literature. I mean, you know, when you think about people taking psychotropic medication and the, the similar side effects that people yep. tolerate mm -hmm. um, in order to have 
better management of the symptoms or even just to prevent a deterioration um, of the mental health condition. Um, it's a, sh- you know, it's it's quite shocking that this yeah. hasn't been explored more. Yes. Um, really, I think. Yeah, I think so too. I think it it involves a little bit more management because, like I say, you might want to coach someone through it a bit more and kind of s- and see how they're doing. Because the other interesting thing with light is it's, I mean, I just described to you how, you know, most researchers think that light, light is working on the body, but on the brain, you have the, the added uh, methodology that you can pulse the light at certain frequencies. Now, w- now we know that the brain is emitting brain waves and that these brain waves tend to correspond with certain states of mind. And so you can utilize light in a, in a pulsed modality, again, to, to change people's mental state. Now that, that has been shown certainly for Alzheimer's to have a hugely beneficial effect. And so perhaps if we looked at it for other kind of mental conditions, we would find out, okay, how can we modulate these signals in order to imp- increase the efficacy of the therapy? But it does require a little bit more than just giving someone a drug and off they go. You know, you need to kind of monitor it. How are they doing? Is 10 hertz good for this person or do you need 40 hertz? So I think from that point of view, it's maybe the reason why in our kind of modern, very rushed, people only get five minutes at the doctor world, it's easier to give a a drug where it's a standardized dose, even though people aren't standardized. And of course, different people are going to react differently to the drug than maybe to monitor somebody on a light therapy program, which is a shame because long term, you know, with a, with a drug treatment, we know the body's got to deal with that. And long term, you can be causing more issues in the future. You know, something like light therapy, if properly explored, you're right. It's a shame because um, potentially it could help people and it could help people much more long term. Yeah, we recently interviewed Christopher Charles, who's a, a software developer involved with Rushy Wave Glasses and that uses pulsed lights, sort of red, green and blue lights um, in order to create calming brainwave um, yeah. patterns and again, without a risk of side effects. But that led me down a whole rabbit hole of rabbit warren of um, syntonic optometry and how the looking at coloured lights impacts on the hypothalamus. Um, so non-visual path- pathways getting, getting, um, getting affected by, my, by the light. In terms of, um, obviously, you're somebody who is interested in innovation and progressive things. Where do you see the whole world of light technology going in terms of the future? What, what would be your predictions about how we'll make use of, use of light in the future? Well, I, I must admit, I live in a bit of a bubble because I'm a surrounded by people who are also obsessed by light and who are doing all kinds of innovations. And certainly people who I'm talking to are saying, you know, sooner or later, we're going to discover how the light, even in our buildings, is affecting us. And, and Paul Chizot up in Durham University, I know that he, was, he sent me a project the other day that was looking at changing the lights in the hospital in order to make the environment for people there, you know, a better environment for healing. And actually the study he was doing, because he couldn't do it on patients, he did it on the nurses there. You know, how can he make their lives easier and less stressful, really just by modifying the light in buildings because because we're talking about red light therapy devices because at the moment that's what we can control but really I think in the future planners will have to sort of think about that the light environment when they're building offices and hospitals and schools because really this science is becoming harder and harder to ignore the more it builds up of the effect of people's light environment on their general health so I I certainly would hope and the future that I'm kind of trying to manifest is one where all of the light environment is taken into account and we're aware of, of light environments. You know, it, it's almost like, you know, we have junk food, you know, we know we shouldn't, get, we shouldn't eat sugar and sweets and things, but we should also be aware there's junk light. You know, we shouldn't be looking at blue light after dark. We shouldn't have children in schools under fluorescent lights. We shouldn't have people in hospitals where they don't have access to natural light. So, so certainly for me, I see the future is somewhere where doctors, planners, counsellors, you know, everyone is aware of, of good and bad light. And we try to maximise our towns and our cities to, to give us the best healthy light that we can. That's so fascinating. I know, I know I first started getting interested in light because I was living in a house, which the house was beautiful, but it was so dark inside. You had mm-hmm. to have the lights on all the time. You've had a really sunny day. 
and I thought was absolutely nothing. No way I can live in a house like that again. Well, I, the next house I bought, I made sure that it had a self-facing garden and it's as light as possible because I I felt that it impacted on my mood and my well-being. More generally, but thinking about so David and I have worked in prisons and psychiatric hospitals for a long time, and obviously they're plagued by uh, fluorescent strip lighting, and also you end up with people wearing um, tinted glasses to cope with the effects of the fluorescent light, which I think people find quite toxic yeah. and unpleasant. When you think that actually, if you had light was was um, integrated in such a way that it it offered advantages to to health and well-being, it has the potential to make a massive difference, and probably in quite a low-cost way, as opposed to some of the other um, things like you know, like medication or other well-being um, devices that people try to make use of. Yeah, for sure. I think you're right. Just having some. I mean, there's already been studies on hospitals to show that you can get you recover quickly from heart surgery if you're in the bed next to the window. You know, we already have those studies. So that should be something, you know, especially for those kinds of settings that you've described. Why not, you know, like say, have low level lights, kind of ground level, get rid of all the fluorescent lights, you know, make things as comfortable as possible. Because when you're comfortable and you're relaxed, you know, it's much easier to t kind of deal with any situation that you're in. Thank you. Then, Sarah, um, as we mentioned in the instruction, you've started your own company. Can, can you tell us what you're doing? Yeah, so I, so like I said, I kind of really bought into this, uh, the whole thing about, okay, we could maybe make devices that, because really what we're doing is mimicking sunlight, you know, with these red light therapy devices, they're long wave devices, but we're doing it in a, in a controlled way. And, and like I met, we just spoke about, you can oscillate the frequencies to maybe activate brain states. Um, and at the time I really was thinking, yeah, that's, that's what we need. And that I'm going to do like my brain coaching and set it up, but there wasn't a device like that. And so I really just went to a couple of manufacturers and, uh, companies to see if they could make that device. And actually I came across this brilliant company in the Netherlands. Um, and they said, sure, we can make it, but we'd like you to head up the company if we make it because that, you know, they also saw the value in it. Actually, one of them, the members there, he had a, a very beloved, um, grandparent who was had neurodegeneration and so he was very keen on starting the company uh, and that's really how I became like a CEO of this company it was never the intention to do that but actually it's been a great journey and we're just about to launch the product and it's a headband it goes across it's very lightweight very easy to use not like these big heavy devices just goes across here across the frontal cortex and one on the cerebellum at the back and one across the gut because a lot of the studies now coming out with all kinds of um, brain disorders show a very um, a big gut component, like the condition of your back, your gut bacteria and how your vagus nerve carries information from your gut. And even inflammation in the gut can have a huge impact on all kinds of mental health conditions and neurodegeneration. So this, this product that I've developed, it's called the Sarah system. It has both components. So you shine light not only onto the surface of the cortex using the headband, but you also use a panel that goes across the gut that has this long wave red light also. That's quite different to the other things that are on the market as well, isn't there? And I've got a Saluma band, which you can place over any part of your body. Yes. You can only put it over one part of your body at once, whereas your device sounds quite portable and quite easy, but also the fact that you can access two, two areas simultaneously. Yeah, I've designed it deliberately to make it accessible, like move any boundaries because I've got I've got a lot of device. I mean, I've got I'm looking over there, I've got cupboards and cupboards full of light devices, but a lot of them you have to plug in and so you have to find a place sit down and do it, which I'm always on the go and doing things and so that's I have a bit of resistance to do that. But so this device is totally portable. You have a battery, you just velcro it on and you put the headband on and you're good to go. And it's also just 10 minutes because it's fairly high dose. And because we can modulate the, the wavelength, you can be very targeted in the therapy, you know, depending what you want to do. You know, some, most of the time I have it on focus mode because I'm really trying to get stuff done. But sometimes, you know, you might want to have meditation or you might want to relax. And so I think that's, that's one of the main advantages is you're getting both the gut and the brain, but you're also able to be a bit more specific about what, what you want to do with your brain state. 
thank you. These these are fascinating things. And um, you and Naomi are the scientists, and I'm I'm the non scientist among the three of us. And also, I've been a bit of a skeptic, um, but Naomi Naomi has persisted in this line, <laughs> and I, I I think we're going to have to do a, a kind of um, um, edition which brings some of these themes together because they've all got challenges, of course. So. I mean, I'm thinking I worked at a place called the Millfields Unit, which was a newly designed forensic unit in East London. Loads and loads and loads of light. It was really very, very lightful. But in the summer, it got impossibly hot. You know? oh. <laughs> so I mean, overcoming those challenges is both complex and uh, yeah, tends to be more expensive, doesn't it? At least in the initial stages. It reminds me we've spent some time uh, talking with Dominic uh, Moran, uh, who who's specializes in studying particularly the architecture of prisons and places like that. I'm sure this is the kind of thing she'd be interested in. So yeah, help me with. Yeah, it, it does need a bit of thought. You're right. It needs some planning because, yes, you're right. You don't want to put people in greenhouses. Um, but, but at the same time, you know, maybe it it just would take a little bit more planning. And in some of these buildings that are already established, it could just be as simple as like replacing the, the fixtures that are there. Um, but what was your, what's your resistance, David? You said you're a skeptical. What would be well, your resistance? like I didn't used to think that the, yeah, the guts uh, microbe had anything to do with my life. Um, <laughs> and now I'm coming around to a, a different idea. Um, yeah. I, suppose, I suppose we're learning more and more about how we how we've come into being as human beings and how we function. I was quite shocked to learn that eighty five percent of our serotonin is produced in our gut, isn't it? And it's like that's incredible when you think about all this attention for mm. mental health conditions going to the brain without you know for years without thinking about anything from the downwards really. Yeah, it's interesting, and there's so many studies coming out all the time that link the 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 microbiome to, to all kinds of different conditions. And, and, you know, they've gone the other way. Okay. How about if we modify the microbiome, does it actually alleviate the, the condition? And it does, you know, so that's, that's hugely, like you say, it's actually an aha moment for a lot of people in that what is going on in the gut is actually impacting how you feel. I mean, there was a really interesting study that I just saw in LinkedIn that was talking about people's microbiome and um, addictive disorder, addictive personality disorder. And they found that people with addictive personality disorder have a, have a profile, a gut profile, which they can now recognize and say, okay, but looking at your gut flora, we think that you're more liable to have addictive personality disorder. Well, that's fascinating because potentially that it's, it's not you, you know, some of these cravings are not you, you, the human, you know, it's coming from the bacteria demanding certain substances and, and you're kind of responding to that because we are really a collection of human cells and bacteria and actually we're a lot more bacteria than we are human. <laughs> and, and so, you know, it's no surprise really that, that you know, the needs and wants of the bacteria are impacting on our day-to-day -day because we, we are just a collection of cells when it comes to it. We're kind of a, a collaboration of cells. And, and so, yeah, that is interesting. And actually, there's a lot more signals going from the gut to the brain than there is from the brain to the gut. The, the gut is actually telling the body, you know, it's actually collecting a lot more signals from the environment to give to the brain than the other way around. As you were talking, I was thinking about the, um, the, the, the American intelligence agents testifying in Congress about the, not the evidence of non-human bodies and wondering whether it might be too but the theory, yes. um, but also um, the, there's a clinical trial, isn't there, with Simcrew, which is a probiotic, um, and they're researching the effect that that might have on Parkinson's yeah. disease. So I think I think David sometimes thinks I've come up with some really good <laughs> ideas, but but they are all based in things things that I've read from a science perspective. Yes, that's right. Yeah, we just need more. We just need more studies to kind of you know really determine exactly what's going on but like I said I think it's becoming harder and harder to ignore the impact of things like that when so much so many studies are being published yeah and less dominance of big farm I think yeah <laughs> yes so thanks for that Sarah but there's another challenge of course which is the challenge of costs and 
expense. So the device you're describing sounds like a fairly cutting edge here device mm -hmm. and, and it's going to be fairly expensive. So the challenge then becomes how to make these things more accessible to a wider range of people. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, right now, you know, it's the developing a new device. You're right. It is expensive. And my device is going, is going to come out at the moment. It's like a um, 800 pounds. So that's, you know, that's a lot for a lot of people, especially a lot of people in Britain where we're used to getting um, care on the NHS. However, there are ways that all of these technologies can be integrated uh, into hospitals and clinics. You know, there's no reason why um, a hospital or a clinic can't have access to some of these devices and then people go and and get their light therapy session. The same with any of these institutes. You know, you could have light therapy devices that people could use. You know, it doesn't have to be an individual device. Um, and also when you kind of work it out as a, as a cost basis for, you know, hospital treatment for people who do get side effects from their medication and have to go into hospital and use up hospital beds. I mean, you can't really cost it out Immediately, mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of costs are further down the line and someone has to pay, don't they? I mean, the, as a nation, we are getting sick. There's no doubt about it. Chronic illness is on the rise. Mental health conditions are on the rise and it takes its toll financially one way or the other. So taking this preventative medicine, you know, we none of us want to get dementia as we get older. If we could prevent it by having these kinds of devices now, I think people would not put a price on not having, you know, severe dementia when they're older. So it's just a case of, of being, of thinking a bit more long-term, I think. Yes. And about winning the argument and con convincing people of the positive benefits, because what you're talking about really is the cost of a new TV. And actually nearly all of us have got big TVs in our, in our house. I think I was wondering, so in terms of thinking about protecting um, from age-related degeneration, is like I listened to the Huberman lab and he was talking about how red, looking at red light prevents macular degeneration. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering whether your device can be used for that purpose as well. Um, actually, there is a company that have now got an FDA classification for the use of red light for macular degeneration, Lumathera, and that's awesome because that is kind of really paving the way for these kind of therapies to be used in that therapeutic se uh, setting. My device in particular, no, I wouldn't recommend it because actually it's quite a high dose device. Mm -hmm. And although it's, you know, you can look, look in it to actually stare at a bright light is not very comfortable. You know, the way that they do it in a therapeutic session is they, ha you know, you look in and the device is quite far away and they're measuring a lot of stuff to making sure you're not overdoing it because our eyes are quite sensitive to red light. But certainly there's a lot of evidence to suggest that people get a lot less macular degeneration if they're just outside for a few hours every day, you know, if you're away from your screen, because as good as red light is for your eyes, you know, also blue light, which is our screens, can be detrimental. You know, blue, blue light is a lot shorter wavelength. It's more energetic, the light, and so therefore it can have more of a damaging effect. So I think there are things you can do to help with your vision. For example, you know, you don't even need any of these devices. You just need to get up, see the sunrise. You know, that's your dose of red light right there. Uh, and it's free every morning mm -hmm. and, uh, and every evening, you know, twice a day. You can get your dose of red light without having any of these expensive devices and without having a macular degeneration machine and potentially preserve your eyesight. So I think there are a lot of things that people can implement in their lives where you don't, you know, you don't need anything. All you need to do is find somewhere where you can see the sunrise or the sunset and, you know, you can get the benefits. <laughs> Thank you very much. So what have you learned about yourself over the course of, of uh, the work that you've been doing and the various pathways that you followed? Um, I think tolerance, because certainly, you know, you're kind of faced with, I'm, I'm faced every day with a lot of people a lot of backlash about some of the stuff that I do, you know, certainly when I was doing some of the more fringe studies and now even with red light therapy, because like I say, for some people, it is a bit fantastic that you can heal with light, but of course you don't know till you know. And so from my point of view, it's just to kind of be a bit doggedly just to keep going in, in the face of that. And, 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 
And also I think, like I say, because I do have the advantage of doing the very extreme orthodox and doing the very extreme kind of woo-woo, if you like, is to just have a balanced approach and, and a holistic approach because it's not just going to be one thing that's going to fix something. The more holistic you can be and the more closer to nature you can kind of be in your thinking, the, the more chance I think you have of, of, of getting wellness. So I, I don't kind of, I don't stick to any one thing. I don't advocate that people just do light therapy and that's a be all and end all. I try to be holistic and inclusive in what I think about. And so I think that maybe, I, maybe I'm just getting older, but I think I've just developed a bit more tolerance and a bit more patience. So in, in keeping about, because you're clearly a diligent scientist, but you also, as you say, have done some, uh, to use your own words, fringe things. Yes. I mean, that could mean anything in California, yeah. of course. <laughs> of so course, yeah. how do you keep a, a watch on that? Do you have a kind of third eye that you use? Um, we, no, and, and actually sometimes it's great fun just to kind of really go with some of these really far out experiments and just see where it takes you. But I think certainly my training does kick in. You know, I, I have I have got university degrees and I did spend a long time doing, you know, doing very methodological studies with Glaxo. So I always bring that to whatever I'm doing. And and maybe sometimes I discount some things because of that. You know, maybe there are some interesting things that are going on that are totally outside. I mean, I went to I went to a conference the other day where they were talking about physics from the point of view of Indian theology, theology and Sanskrit. And, you know, I, I had to really try and open my brain to, to kind of include that. And even then I just wasn't able to because it's just not my background. And so, you know, I had to say, okay, it sounds fascinating, but I, at the moment I can't go there, but I would love to, you know, if I could duplicate myself a few times, I would definitely go and study all this Sanskrit stuff. So I think... How I deal with it is I, I just come from my own experience and I just try and stick with measuring things scientifically, but at the same time being very open-minded that there are a lot of things we just can't measure right now. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And Sandra, if you were to focus on one simple action that listeners could take to improve their well-being, what would you, what would you advise? Um, I would advise for anyone to try and be outside more and to just pay attention to your light environment. Just be aware of your light environment. Like if you're the, if you're the person that looks at their mobile phone before they see any kind of natural light, just change that. Change that for a month. Don't look at your phone or any. Don't turn any lights on before you either stick your head out of the window or plant your feet on the ground outside and look at the sun. Or you know, if you're in England, look at the grey sky. But whatever it is, you're still getting light. And see how you feel. See if that makes you feel different to, to not look at an artificial light first thing in the morning. You know, if that just one thing. I mean, of course, you can then sort of look at what else am I doing? Am I looking at telly at night? Am I looking at my screen late? Is the last thing I see when I shut my laptop? You want to try and fix that. But I would suggest for people who are just starting off, the one thing to do is only see natural light as the first light that you see in the morning would be my challenge. Thank you very much, Sarah. I really enjoyed that conversation. Yeah, that Thank was a you. fantastic. I really enjoyed it too. Great fun. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. It was lovely to meet you both.